BBC Radio 7. With the rich getting richer and the poor getting ever more desperate, violent uprisings are brewing in 18th century Ireland. This is A Short History of Ireland in 240 episodes. Episode 129, The Hearts of Steel and the Hearts of Oak. Irish tenants paid their landlords twice a year on what were known as Gale Days. These fell in May and November. Just after each Gale Day, Lord Bandon, who owned the large estate in County Cork, threw a party for his tenants. In the spring of 1793, the task of organising the revels was left to his land agent. None who were not tenants did I invite, except those named by you, Father Morgan Flaherty, Tim McCarthy, Charles Casey, Dr Lane and Father Nolan, son to old John. These I asked as Catholics particularly attached to you. Twenty-two favoured tenants were seated in the parlour, others in the breakfast parlour and the rest in a large tent on the avenue. The agent continued. In the parlour your claret was made free with, as Stephen tells me he opened 34 bottles. In the breakfast parlour, port wine and rum punch were supplied in abundance, and abroad, large libations of whisky punch. We had two quarter casks, above 80 gallons, of that beverage made the day before, which was drawn unsparingly for those abroad, and plenty of beer besides. An ox was roasted whole at one end of the turf house, on a large ash beam by way of a spit, and turned with a wheel by Tom O'Brien. Six sheep were also sacrificed on the occasion. All was happiness, mirth and good humour. God save great George our King was cheered within and abroad. Wise landlords, like Lord Bandon, understood that it made good sense to keep the tenantry happy. Others could be negligent or ruthless. Landlords had a habit of encouraging what was known as the hanging gale. That is, allowing tenants to fall behind in payment of rent by six months or more. Because these tenants had broken the terms of their leases, they could then be legally evicted and replaced with men prepared to pay higher rents. When their leases expired, tenants found that they had to pay heavy sums known as fines and greatly increased rents to renew their leases. Where still, they could be evicted and replaced. During 1770, matters came to a head in County Antrim. Tenants had been evicted by the Upton family from their Temple Patrick estate. Poor tenants had been ejected and replaced by speculators, including the Belfast merchant Waddell Cunningham, who had been able to outbid them when their leases expired. In that same year of 1770, the leases of Lord Donegal's County Antrim estate expired. Leases were renewed only if heavy fines were paid. Finds many tenants could not pay. On the morning of Sunday, the 23rd of December, angry farmers gathered at Temple Patrick Meeting House and, armed with firelocks, pistols, and pitchforks, they set out for Belfast. The farmers numbered at least 1,200 as they advanced on the town's north gate, now North Street. Calling themselves the Hearts of Steel, they surged round the army barrack intent on forcing the release of a comrade held prisoner on a charge of maiming cattle. Dr Alexander Halliday, a leading citizen, attempted to negotiate the release of the prisoner. A contemporary letter describes what happened next. The doctor had just reached the barrack on his embassy, passing through an immense multitude, when the gate was thrown open by the military, who fired upon the assailants, killed five persons and wounded nine others. In the meantime, Cunningham's house in Hercules Lane, now Royal Avenue, was burning fiercely, putting the whole town in danger. At one o'clock in the morning, the Sovereign, the Mayor in other words, saw no alternative but to give up the prisoner to prevent the destruction of Belfast. The revolt of the Hearts of Steel spilled over into Mid-Ulster, merging with another group calling themselves the Hearts of Oak. They had been resisting the cess. This was a rate imposed by grand juries to pay for roads and bridges. In March 1772, when Sir Richard Johnston of Guildford in County Down captured the ringleader of this bandite, his house was besieged the next day. A witness reported, They began to fire at the windows and set the officers on fire. 
upon which Mr. Morell, our dissenting minister, desirous to prevent further bloodshed, drew up a window in order to speak out to them, but was saluted by four musket balls in his head and breast. He fell dead out of the window. Sir Richard Johnson hung out a flag of truce and escaped through a back window. He gathered together a posse of 150 men to tackle the Hearts of Oak, but decided to wait for the support of the army. This had been only one incident in a series of disturbances causing the Irish Parliament to rush through an act for the more effectual punishment of wicked and disorderly persons in Antrim, Down, Armagh, the city and county of Londonderry and county Tyrone. Retribution swiftly followed. BBC Radio 7 First then, as the tenant farmers launched what became known as the Land Law, the story of Captain Charles Boycott unfolds in today's Irish History Lesson. This is a short history of Ireland in 240 episodes. Episode 195, The Land War. In March of the year 1879, a secret meeting took place in northern France. Here, John de Voy, the head of Clan na Gael, the main Fenian organisation in America, met Charles Stuart Parnell, the Irish Party MP. De Voy explained what he described as a new departure. The Fenians would abandon plans for armed revolt and support the drive for home rule, provided Parnell backed the campaign of tenant farmers against the landlords. Though he was careful not to put it in writing, Parnell did not hesitate to give his approval. Michael David played a pivotal role in brokering this deal between Republican revolutionaries and constitutional nationalist politicians. David was a Fenian who had recently been released from a term of penal servitude after a conviction for illegal arms dealing. He was to make sure that Parnell would lead a great national campaign to break the power of the landlords. During that year of 1879, drenching rain, bad harvests and the reappearance of potato blight had brought many families, particularly in the west of Ireland, to the brink of starvation. County Mayo took the lead in defying the landlords and in the formation of the Irish National Land League in October 1879. A poster explained its aims. First, to put an end to rack-renting, eviction and landlord oppression. Second, to effect such a radical change in the land system of Ireland as will put it in the power of every Irish farmer to become the owner on fair terms of the land he tills. Such excitement had not been witnessed in Ireland since Daniel O'Connell's monster meetings for repeal of the Union more than 30 years before. Huge numbers of country people threatened with eviction, unemployment and starvation assembled to hear fiery speeches from Land League agitators. Economic conditions worsened in the hard winter of 1879 to 1880. And once again, torrential rains in the ensuing spring and summer threatened to ruin the harvest. As the general election of 1880 approached, the Fermanagh Times declared, The question of the hour is a sad one, destitution. It is echoed from the giant causeway to the Cove of Cork. Go where we may throughout Ireland today, we hear the wail of distress for food. The Land League demanded substantial rent reductions, and if these were refused, Tenants were urged not to pay the rent. The Liberal leader, W.E. Gladstone, declared that eviction notices were now falling like snowflakes. This seemed all too true. How could evictions be stopped without recourse to violence? The Land League's answer was to make life impossible for any farmer who took over an evicted man's holding. Michael Davitt, at a meeting in Knockaroo in County Mayo, made reference to a holding from which the occupier had just been evicted. This farm, I trust, will not be tenanted by any man. 
If such a traitor to your cause enters this part of the country, why, keep your eyes fixed upon him, point him out, and if a pig of his falls into a bog hole, let it lie there. Charles Stuart Parnell, the president of the Land League, had returned from a brilliant whistle-stop tour of America, where he'd made speeches to Irish Americans in 62 towns and cities, addressed congressmen in the House of Representatives, and raised great sums for famine relief and for the Land League. Now, Parnell gave his full support for the approach recommended by Michael Davitt. At Ennis in County Clare on Sunday the 19th of September, even though it was four in the morning, hundreds were waiting for him when he arrived from Dublin. A procession formed up with lighted torches and a band to escort him to his hotel. Later in the day, as a crowd of 12,000 stood before him, Parnell asked, Now, what are you going to do with a tenant who bids for a farm from which his neighbour has been evicted? Shoot him! Now I think I heard somebody say shoot him! But I wish to point out to you a more Christian, a more charitable way which will give the lost sinner an opportunity of repenting. When a man takes a farm from which another has been evicted, you must show him on the roadside, at the shop counter, in the fair and at the marketplace and even in the house of worship by leaving him severely alone, by putting him in a sort of moral coventry, by isolating him from the rest of his kind as if he were a leper of old. You must show him your detestation of the crime he has committed. Soon after, this advice was followed with brilliant effect in County Mayo against Captain Charles Boycott. On the 18th of October, 1880, the Times published a letter from Ireland. It was written by Captain Charles Boycott, an army captain from Norfolk. Boycott had an estate surrounding Loch Mask House in County Mayo. He also acted as the agent for Lord Erne's extensive properties in the province of Connaught. After several seasons of atrocious weather, tenants had been unable to pay the rent. Boycott had issued eviction orders, but, as he explained to the press, his process server had been intimidated and driven back. Now, he told readers, a howling mob had coerced all his workers to leave him. The blacksmith and the laundress refused to work for his family. The shopkeepers in nearby Ballon Robe would not serve him. In its editorial, the Times concluded, The persecution of the writer, Mr. Boycott, for some offence against the Land League's code is an insult to the government and to public justice. Loyalists in Ireland agreed, and the Belfast newsletter headed a campaign to send an expedition to rescue Captain Boycott. Ulster Protestants clamoured to be part of an expedition to lift his potatoes and thresh his corn. When arrangements were made to hire a special train to take hundreds of Loyalists to Mayo, the anxious Irish Chief Secretary, W.E. Foster, wrote to Prime Minister Gladstone, This would be civil war. We know the whole countryside would be up against them. Foster rushed a thousand additional troops to Mayo to reinforce the police protecting boycott. Then he announced that there would be no special train and he strictly limited the rescue team to 50 men. And so... 25 orange men from County Cavan and 25 orange men from County Monaghan boarded a train at Clonus on the 11th of November, 1880. At Athlone, each volunteer was issued with a revolver. Then, as the orange labourers marched out of the station at Clare Morris, between lines of soldiers with bayonets fixed, a great crowd of local people subjected them to a storm of groans, hissing, hooting and booing. As darkness fell, the rain lashed down in blinding sheets. The owners of carriages hired by the police refused to allow their vehicles to take the orangemen. The Ulster men had no choice but to walk to Ballinrobe, and that took them five hours. Next morning, after spending the night in the infantry barracks, the men tramped the final four miles to Loch Mask House. The cavalcade of orangemen, infantry, cavalry and police was described by the Daily News correspondent as being like a huge red serpent with a black head and tail. At the iron gates to Loch Mask House, Captain Boycott gave no greeting 
to the 50 labourers who had come so far to salvage his crops. The cavern and Malchan men sang orange songs around the campfires they'd built, and then settled down for the night in rain-sodden tents supplied by the army. Captain Boycott provided potatoes, but rather meanly charged the orangemen ninepence a stone. Despite a torrential rainstorm, accompanied by gale-force winds, the men were up early next morning. The task ahead was formidable. They had to lift two acres of potatoes, eight acres of turnips, and seven acres of mangolds. Twenty acres of corn had already been cut, but the sheaves had all still to be threshed. Meanwhile, the Land League imposed a strict discipline on the local people. They followed the instructions given by the Connaught Telegraph. Be calm, be cool, and at the same time resolute and determined. Treat those mailed and buckshot warriors with silence and contempt. Show the world over by your calm but resolute demeanour that you are worthy of your name and traditions. To the great disappointment of foreign correspondents, some from as far away as the Russian Empire and the United States, there were no incidents of violence. After two weeks... On Friday, the 26th of November, the work was finished. To reinforce the current nationalist joke that the clerk of the weather had joined the Land League, the worst storm that Mayo had endured for many years burst over the area. The Orange Men had a sleepless last night as their tents in the encampment were ripped to shreds. The relief of Captain Boycott was proclaimed a victory by loyalists but it had cost £10,000 to save his crops, and they weren't worth a tenth of that sum. To rescue every beleaguered landlord in this way would be quite impossible. The French newspaper Le Figaro reported, The bright Irish have invented a new word. They are currently saying to boycott somebody, meaning to ostracise him. Boycotting now swept the country. Any landlord attempting to evict tenants suddenly found himself powerless. Evictions fell sharply. The Land League was the real victor in this episode, which had captured the imagination of the world. What would Prime Minister Gladstone do now? Francis Tomalty, James Green and Richard Dormer were the people behind the voices you heard in today's episode. It was written by Dr Jonathan Barden and produced by Alison Finch. Episode 212, The Great Dublin Lockout. Dublin had once been the second city of the British Empire. But since the Act of Union in 1800, she had struggled to prosper. Apart from Guinness's Brewery and Jacob's Biscuit Factory, the city had failed to acquire industries of any size. And by the start of the 20th century... Doctors, lawyers, public servants and other members of the middle classes, commuting by electric tram, had moved out to the suburbs. The once elegant Georgian terraces they left behind decayed to become shabby tenements, rented out room by room to the families of the poor. Most of these slum dwellers eked out a living as casual labourers, carters and dockers. Women earned pittances as domestic servants and washerwomen, or became prostitutes seeking business from the many soldiers stationed in the city. Disease flourished in the crowded, damp and drafty tenements. Dublin's death rate was the highest in the United Kingdom. Labour unrest over much of Europe spilled across into Ireland. Jim Larkin, a union leader from Liverpool, led a great dock strike in Belfast in 1907. He then moved to Dublin where he founded the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. William Martin Murphy set out to smash Larkin's Union. Murphy owned the Dublin tramways, the Irish Independent newspaper, and much more besides. He offered his employees a stark choice. Leave the ITGWU or lose your jobs. On the 21st of August 1913, he dismissed a hundred men. This the trade unionists described as a lockout. Given courage by Murphy, other employers also locked out their workers. A titanic class struggle had begun. Jim Larkin called all the tramway workers out on strike on the 26th of August. As the future playwright Sean O'Casey remembered, 
while all Dublin was harnessing itself into its best for the horse show, the tram suddenly stopped. Drivers and conductors left them standing wherever they happened to be. They came out bravely, marching steadily towards hunger, harm and hostility. Every night, Larkin stiffened the resolve of the workers with his fiery oratory. The Irish aristocratic radical, Countess Markievicz, recalled, Listening to Larkin, I realised that I was in the presence of some great primeval force rather than a man. A tornado, a storm-driven wave, a rush of life into spring and the blasting breath of autumn all seemed to emanate from the power that spoke. The authorities banned the meeting in O'Connell Street fixed for the 31st of August. That Sunday, Larkin, wearing Count Markievicz's frock coat, stepped into the Imperial Hotel opposite Nelson Pillar, a hotel owned, incidentally, by William Martin Murphy. Ernie O'Malley was there. Jim Larkin, to keep a promise, appeared on the balcony of the hotel, wearing a beard as a disguise. He spoke amidst cheers and hoots for the employers. Police swept down from many quarters, hemmed in the crowd and used their heavy batons. I saw women knocked down and kicked. I could hear the crunch as the heavy sticks struck unprotected skulls. Heavy-handed action by the police, who killed one man, resulted in a special government inquiry. The dispute paralysed the city. William Murphy now had 404 employers behind him. The strikers and their families were starving. British trade unionists sent a steamship every week loaded with food. Better-off sympathisers helped to run soup kitchens. George Russell, the writer from Portadown, who signed himself A.E., fired off an angry letter to the newspapers. It remained for the 20th century and the capital city of Ireland to see 400 masters deciding openly upon starving 100,000 people. You may succeed in your policy and ensure your own damnation by your victory. The men whose manhood you have broken will loathe you and will always be brooding and scheming to strike a fresh blow. The infant being moulded in the womb will have breathed into its starved body the vitality of hate. It is not they, it is you, who are blind Samsons, pulling down the pillars of the social order. As the lockout continued, the strike leaders decided to send some of the starving children to be looked after for a time by families in Liverpool. The Archbishop of Dublin objected that the children might be sent to homes which were not Catholic. The Dublin women now subjected to this cruel temptation to part with their helpless offspring can no longer be held worthy of the name of Catholic mothers. Jim Larkin toured England to raise support, but failed to get the sympathetic strikes he needed to win in Dublin. On the 18th of January 1914, the Union advised the men to return to work. Larkin declared, We are beaten. We make no bones about it. Meanwhile, throughout this labour dispute, which was in effect a struggle within the nationalist camp, the issue of home rule never dropped out of sight. A Short History of Ireland was written by Dr Jonathan Barden and in it you heard Francis Tomalty, James Green and Richard Dormer. It was produced by Alison Finch.